You are about to hear a strange but true story. Legend has it, Harry Houdini, the master magician, once claimed that he could break out of any jail cell in the world. All he had to do was walk into that jail cell with his street clothes on. I'll be out of there in one hour, no problem, he said. Well, a very old jail down south heard about Houdini's claims and they accepted his challenge. On the day of the event, many people gathered outside. Very confidently, Houdini walked right into the jail and into the cell and they shut the metal doors behind him. The first thing Houdini did was he took off his coat. Then very strangely, he took off his belt. Secretly hidden in Houdini's belt was a 10 inch piece of steel, very tough and very flexible. And Houdini started working. In about 30 minutes, that confident expression Houdini had when he walked in disappeared. In one hour, he was bathed in sweat. And at the end of two hours, Houdini in defeat collapsed against the door, which then opened. It opened because you see, that door had never been locked. But that's not entirely true, is it? That door was locked. It was firmly and thoroughly locked in Houdini's mind, which meant it was locked as if the best locksmith in the world had put his lock on it. The mind is powerful. How many doors in your life do you think are locked but aren't? How many times have you been stuck in the mental prison of overthinking? Something that really had a simple solution. There is an ancient African proverb that says, when there is no enemy within, the enemy outside can do us no harm. Your mind is the most powerful force you will ever face. It will tell you lies. It will tell you, you can't do that. You're not meant for that. You're not good enough for that. You can't go on anymore. You don't have the energy. You must thank it for its opinion and carry on. Because like Houdini showed us, the only locked doors that exist are in your own mind. The doors in reality are open. And all you have to do is walk through. Welcome to Black History Month. A warm greetings to all members of our community. I want to welcome you into this space. And now, for the first time ever, you are going to gain a special insight into the philosophy and opinions of one of the greatest men to have ever walked this earth. We have been celebrating a remarkable life and legacy throughout the 31 days of October as we bring you the resurrection of Marcus Messiah Garvey, a series which will be presented by me, Jermaine Brown, featuring 31 brothers from across our community, all chosen to resurrect different speeches, articles and essays from Marcus Garvey daily. Now, before we get into today's main speech, Here's some important information that you need to know about the man, the myth, the movement and the legend. Marcus Masai Garvey was the founder and organizer of the largest independent black movement in the world, the Universal Negro Improvement Association and the African Communities League. At the heights of success, the organization had a worldwide membership of over 11 million subscribed members. Now this was an excellent feat especially when we consider that this happened during a time of no smartphones, no internet and no social media and during the midst of two world wars. Yet he dared to travel the world, even to non-English speaking regions, spreading his message of self-love and empowerment. 
Now this was at a time when it was particularly dangerous for black men and women to wander outside of their own homes. But these factors did not stop the man and the movement, for he had at his disposal an unmatched confidence. He did not fear failure. He did not care about the laughter and the ridicule hurled at him, for he had a fearless passion for the advancement of black people worldwide that fueled his mission. Now I'm intrigued to know more about the mind of this man and how he accomplished so much. What can I take from him that I can apply to my life today? I wonder. This is program 25 of our series with the six day countdown starting now. Today's speech was delivered at Bethel Church, Halifax, Canada and reprinted in the UNIA's Black Man's Newspaper on October 1937. The speech was delivered three years before Garvey died and it is perhaps one of the most spiritual speeches ever delivered by Garvey. On a level. The chairman Riverford Stewart said before the meeting commenced, I have not the least hesitation in saying that never in all of our history has there been anyone who has done so much to raise the consciousness of the people as Mr. Garvey has done. Let's go back in time to Halifax to take you to the meeting. The speech is titled, The Making of Self. Today's narration is by Tawanda Mohammed from Birmingham, UK, via Zimbabwe. I am the Chairman Reverend Stewart. We all have heard of Mr. Garvey and the work he has been doing to lift the coloured people. He has their interest at heart. Mr. Garvey was once a member of the City Council of Jamaica and he's now permanent resident in England. I can assure you it is a great treat that you are in for in listening to him. Mr. Garvey's movement, I feel sure, has been the thought that as a race, the standard of coloured people should be lifted. There are dozens of coloured men who have made history, but speaking of the coloured people as a race, I have not the least hesitation in saying that never in all our history have there been anyone who has done so much to raise the race consciousness of the people as Mr. Garvey has done. I shall not take up more of your time, because I do not want to rob you of this privilege because Mr. Garvey has a message to deliver which will rest in your hearts and will send you home thinking. I have pleasure in introducing to you Mr. Marcus Garvey. You are listening to an Honor Level production featuring the resurrection of Marcus Messiah Garvey series. Mr. Poster, Doctor, citizens and friends of Halifax, I am here really today, accidentally, due to the fact that I am on a tour that extends to the Leeward and Windward Islands of the British West Indies and Demerara. I left England two months ago, principally to preside over a regional conference in Toronto, made up of the branches or divisions of the Universal Negro Improvement Association of which I am President General from the United States and Canada. That conference was convened from the 21st to the 31st of August when hundreds of representatives came up from the United States and Canada. Immediately following that conference, I remained in Toronto for the entire month of September as principal to the first school of African philosophy where I taught and graduated a number of men and women as leaders of the organization in the United States. In continuation of that tour, I am to go to the Leeward and Windward Islands and Demerara. To do so, I had to travel up this way. In anticipation of my arrival here, I arranged through local representatives for meetings in different parts of Nova Scotia. In other parts of the province, there are branches of my organization, such as in Sydney, Glace Bay and New Waterford. I had a splendid time at each place and met splendid groups of people all through. Unfortunately, 
We have no branch of the association in Halifax or in St. John's and no representative in either place. Fortunately for me, however, I met the Reverend Stewart in Toronto. He visited the office of the president of the Toronto Division, Barrister Pitt, and I discussed with him two meetings, one at St. John's and one at Halifax. Not being acquainted with the UNIA, he did that in a way he thought best. In coming, I find that the methods of the community are different to the methods which I'm accustomed to in other parts of the world. And so you will understand that the difficulties that arose when you came here and the lateness of the meeting are due to the fact that arrangements had to be reshuffled. I'm a public lecturer, but I'm also President General of the Universal Negro Improvement Association. As a public lecturer, I endeavor to help to educate the public, particularly those of the Negro race, as I meet that public. There is always a charge for admission, in that I feel that if the public is thoughtful, it will be benefited by the things I say. I do not speak carelessly or recklessly, but with a definite object of helping the people, especially those of my race, to know, to understand, and to realize themselves. Whether that audience be one, or two, or a hundred, it wouldn't matter at all, because I am always honest with my public and desirous of helping even one man to discover himself, to be himself. And I think that people do appreciate that which is helpful to them. And I am hoping that I will say things today helpful to each and every one of you, so that you may be perfectly satisfied that you came to this meeting and that I was present. My subject, therefore, is the making of self. At my age, I've learnt no better lesson than that which I am going to impart to you to make a man what he ought to be, a success in life. Many of the failures, the human failures, our failures, are due to the person himself. Many of those failures could be otherwise but for the misfortune of the person or the individual not knowing himself. I could find no better place to speak in on this subject than probably Halifax from what I have seen here today and from what I have been made to understand. I understand that a large number of the people are not doing well and because of that they could not pay any kind of price to enjoy anything they desire. It is very unfortunate that such a condition should exist. But such will exist all over the world amongst the majority of people simply because the majority have been unfortunate not to discover themselves as individuals and people. There are two classes of men in the world. Those who succeed and those who do not succeed. One who is critical would be tempted to ask how could they be the same people if they are men who succeed and men who do not succeed. Why this difference? If there were not something personal causing the lack of success, then the failure of the individual, the failure of the people, would be attributed to some unkind power who unkindly rules the destiny of these people who failed and some partial power that rules the destiny of those who succeed, thereby being enemy and friend respectively. If success is due to the kindliness and helpfulness of some power outside of you, the individual, then that individual must be partial to those who succeed and must be very unkind to those who do not succeed. I do not know of such a superior being who is responsible for the existence of man as to make some people succeed and some fail. I know of one superior being who is God. And surely God could not be so unfair. Therefore, it is unreasonable and it is illogical. It is not sound philosophy. It is a fact that man fails because of himself and not because of the favor or disfavor of anyone outside of himself. Every man who fails in life contributes to his own failure and neither God nor man is responsible for that failure. He alone is responsible to the extent that he was too indolent, too careless, not to first know and discover himself and to realize his responsibility as a man. God only made one type of man and that was man. He never made several types of men. He made Adam as a man and God has not interfered with his structure. 
He has left him from the Garden of Eden until in this church at Halifax a free sovereign creature having his own hand, his own destiny, his own career. And if he messes it up and becomes a crawling being to be trampled by other men, so long he will go on crawling and God will pass him by without even pity. God made man to be master of the world and this is the world of which man is master. Those who have mastered the world receive the compliment of the Creator and God blesses them to rise to the heights of being Lord and Master, to use the world and occupy the world as He sees fit. I represent a race that has come upon the stage of action to understand what the responsibility of man is and what the responsibility of life is. And so we find ourselves environed by a lawless set of men who have built up tremendous systems in the civilization. They call them social systems, educational systems, religious systems, and all these systems constitute the progress of our age. Men are in action in all parts of God's earth, and we call them, because of their established system, the successful races, as also the Germans, the Italians, the Russians, the Americans, and comparatively, we must admit and think the Negro a failing race. Comparatively, we have done nothing with God's world. What have we done? Where is our British Empire, our French Empire, our American Commonwealth and Canadian Commonwealth, our systems of industry? Where is our system of religion, philosophy, science, art? Where is our system of politics, our system of big business? Nowhere. And so, not only in Halifax, you will find the Negro poor, incapable to do for himself. But everywhere he goes, he must be dependent upon someone else, although he has in him the same pedigree as the man who came out of Adam's ribs in the Garden of Eden. Man was not made to be a cringing, crawling being. He was made to be captain of his own ship, a master of his own destiny, and as he selects, that much out of life he gets, nothing more. Every man around you, the Prime Minister, the great statesman, the thief, all are men who have selected their particular place in this world and shall rise no higher than their selection. I want you to think with me in the hope of assuming your responsibility to be the man that God Almighty created you to be and not the cringing, crawling creature that most of us have become without realizing our place in the world. Is David Lloyd George a man? Is Mackenzie King a man? Answer that. Answer that. Is Mussolini a man? Answer that. Are you man? Answer that. Then ask yourself why these other men are different from you. God made no angels to inhabit this earth. God made no superior creature in man to inhabit this earth. He made only man to inhabit this earth and gave him power and dominion over this earth. Every man who has a soul and every man who has a mind is after and in the image of his creator God. And when any man in the image of God goes below the level, he is not only reducing the God in him, he is humiliating the God in him. God is all powerful and man is made just a little lower than the angels who are made a little lower than God. And man is linked with God, so man is part of God and there could be no God without man and man without God. Man therefore is an agent of God and God is universal intelligence and man is a universal part of God and as the universal intelligence of God created a universe so he confers upon man a power out of which he created the universe for his happiness and for his joy. If you get not happiness out of the earth it is not blamable to God. It is because of your indifference to your own responsibility and to your own function as man and part of God's intelligence. The UNIA comes upon the sin at a late hour, 20 years only. That philosophy which I'm preaching to you today is the philosophy of every Negro. And we say whatever is good for any other man is also good for us as men. If you can appreciate that, you will understand my duty as President General of this movement. We are not seeking to disturb anybody. Each and every one of you sitting before me and any man who will come after, let him be Moses, 
or Joshua. Let him be Abraham. Let him be Mussolini or Hitler. You have in you the potential power of each and every creature who has gone before and each and every creature that will come after in the garb of man. There is no part that man has played from the Garden of Eden that you, when you become conscious of yourself, cannot play. The part that Wolf played at Quebec, the part that Abraham Lincoln played in signing the proclamation, the part that David Lloyd George played in the bloody war, that Mackenzie King is playing in Canada, that Stalin is playing in Russia, that Hitler is playing in Germany, you can play if you select that which is your function in life. There is no king without the thought of being a king. There is no sovereign or dictator without the thought in that direction. As a man thinketh, so is he. There is no chairman of the Canadian Pacific, no president of the Canadian National. The man must first think before the thing becomes reality. Man thinks, and there is a kingdom, there is an empire. What are you thinking sitting down there? What are you thinking in Halifax? Everybody knows what you are thinking. You are thinking just of that humble position you occupy, and that will be your position so long as you think fit. No man goes higher than his thoughts. As he thinks, so shall he live, and so shall he die. I am here only on my thoughts, not on my feet. I am here only on my thoughts, and so are you. I do hope you will think over what is being said to you today, and that you will be amply rewarded for the 35 cents you have invested. We are subject to the thoughts of men. Our civilization is the result of the thoughts of men. You would not be in this church today, but for the fact that long before your fathers came here, men thought logically and built edifices called churches. And so after hundreds and thousands of years, you are able to sit in this structure, the result of the thoughts of men. We are all influenced by the thoughts of men, and when anybody who doesn't know refuses to learn from somebody who knows, there goes the fellow who will be at the mercy of someone who knows. Every man who suffers, suffers because of his ignorance in a particular direction. No intelligent man suffers. You will say that this is not a wise statement because you know educated people around here who still suffer. A man may know how to care for a house, but he doesn't know about building a home. And so as touching architecture, he is ignorant about it. A man who knows about it is likely to rob him of 5,000 pounds in building for him and he, being a fool, the man who knows takes advantage of him. It is the duty of man to make his knowledge so complete in life as to make it impossible for any other man to take advantage of him. That is why you find men always educating themselves inside and outside the schoolroom, finding out everything that is new. I feel that you here want to know what is new so that nobody will have you at a disadvantage. The man who knows walks a world of colossal success. Sometimes you find him an Edison or a Maconi, but the man who doesn't know walks around and begs because he doesn't know. He doesn't know the laws of thrift. He doesn't know the laws of industry, commerce, state. He doesn't know anything about the political system. He is ignorant of everything and yet God never made a fool. Man has made himself a fool. It is the duty of man to learn all of nature's ways if he is to boss nature and be sovereign of the world. A king must know his empire, otherwise his empire will rule him. We have so many fools in the world and those are the people the others feed on. You will ask why does God allow these things to go on? God only recognizes man. He does not recognize rich and poor, particularly when he places him in a world that was here before he came here, knowing well that man would want things for his satisfaction and happiness. When he made man, he made him to enjoy these things. And if man doesn't enjoy these things, it isn't the fault of God because God is intelligent and man is part of God. Do not think your suffering is any virtue that is going to take you into heaven. Your misfortune is the result of your lazy mentality. God did not bless the lazy servant. He cursed and drove away the lazy servant. If man goes around pining and wailing and making himself a useless creature, there is no reward for him but his death. 
I believe in God the Father, Son and Holy Ghost. But I also believe in my mind that I am part of that God, the Father, Son and Holy Ghost. I shall not accuse God the Father, Son and Holy Ghost for being unfair and unjust to me when I have been negligent from my own account and my own mind. You are mentally responsible to yourself and to God as the active servant of your intelligence. And when you fail to appreciate the value of life and life's expression, which are natural gifts, the blame of your non-enjoyment is all yours and no heaven will open to reward you for your own sin. Your sin exemplified in the laziness of your own mind. I can emphasize what I've said that must appeal to you in the most common sense way. No man has ever seen God at any time because it is not necessary. God is in the universe without being visible except through our conception of him because we know he is. But no one has ever seen God at any time on the highway. No one has ever seen God at the riverside building the dock. No one has ever seen God building the Lusitania, the Queen Mary, the Normandy. No one has ever seen God laying the foundation stone of the Royal Bank of Canada the British Houses of Parliament or Westminster Abbey, laying the foundation stone of St. Peter's at Rome. No one has ever seen God laying down railway tracks or building streetcar lines that run from one section of the city to the next. What we know of God is this, that God gives the land and man builds the city. He created the earth and left it in its virgin state for man to use it as he saw fit. And so man built the pyramids, the prairies, expanded the nation to become an empire, and those who were born later see these visible material things but do not understand how they came about. Some think they came by rubbing Aladdin's lamp. Halifax came out of the rocks and the wilderness. Canada came out of the wilds of nature. London came out of the overflooded Thames and Paris came out of the overflooded Sene and Berlin on the Rhine, and Rome came out of the overflooded Elba. Man drained the river in its course, dredged it so that it would not overflow and built up the mighty cities of London, Paris, Rome, Berlin, Montreal, Halifax. It is the work of man, but man does not work until he thinks out the form of the work, so that it is the primary power and effect in the life of man. And the man who doesn't think straight and clear and constructively is the poor fish whom everybody tramples from the journey's beginning to the end because his vision of thought is not clear. The Universal Negro Improvement Association therefore desires to inspire you to the vision of thought that is clear, that is scientific, that is real and positive. What I have to tell you could not be told in one hour because of the peculiarity of your community. Ignorance will always attempt to hold back intelligence, but intelligence will always ride over ignorance and find its goal. Today the world is trying to save itself through the intelligence of the visionaries who can look down the ages. The masses of men are always ignorant because they are too lazy to think. The masses are more concerned with their stomachs and you will find the average man thinking of spending more on his meat and sugar than even intelligently budgeting every 10 cents for the improvement of his intelligence out of a dollar. The men who eat up everything they lay their hands on go to their graves unwept, unsung, unhonored. They eat themselves into all kinds and forms of diseases and so we bury them by the thousands every year. But the men who feed their minds more than their stomachs are the men who have reduced life to a science. They live happier. They live longer. They get more joy and happiness out of life. Watch two families living closely and both earning the same amount of money. One will spend everything on food while the other will spend a portion on literature for the improvement of the family. In 20 years, see which family prospers more and lives longer. The glutton eats himself to death, while the sensible man, by virtue of his intelligence, feeds his mind equally as he feeds his stomach. And so, instead of eating a whole pound of meat, he probably eats less at half the cost 
and probably spend 25 cents for a newspaper, magazine or other good book. After he has had a healthy meal, he sits down under his lamp and keeps up with the activities of the world and his community. There goes a man who will one day rise to be of importance in his community. On the other hand, there is a man who holds his stomach and goes to the doctor often. Such are the common people who live in hovels, who before they die go shabbily around town with no thought to guide them. What is the matter with your mind? Are you different from Rockefeller who discovered oil and became the richest man in the world outside of Henry Ford, the poor boy who visualized the use of propelled mechanism and is the richest man in the world today? You are the same soul. Then why should God be blamed down here by you when you are no good? Life is no joke. It is a positive reality. How many of us are living up to the dignity of men? There are some men who are of no use in the world because they do not exercise any more thoughtfulness about the world than a sheep or a cow. There are some men who could not give a sensible answer to a question because they do not know what is happening and a sheep would know either. Isn't it a slander on God for men to be so ignorant when God gave him intelligence? We are here on our own responsibility. I am here on my own responsibility. God intended me to be on my own responsibility and so in keeping with his intention, he did not join me to anybody. God has made you a unit of his intelligence and you are responsible to him and to the rest of men for your behavior. He has given you all the things of the earth to satisfy you. He has given you control over all animal life and he has given you the beautiful atmosphere to use, to enjoy. Yet some of you live in the darkest places where the rays of the sun never reach. You complain of starvation and hunger. Who gave other men a job? Tell me when God ever called any man to him with the exception of Moses or a few others who had a divine object to carry out. Have you ever thought of that? Every time you beg another man a job, you reduce yourself and elevate the other man. You, the creator of your own joy and your own happiness. Whom did the white man ask for a job to lay the foundation of the city and the nation? He selected his own job to do his own building. He has built his own ships, air fleet, and he goes down into the bosom of the earth and he goes up to the highest of the sky and he carried his commerce from one point to the next, not with angels at the helm, but himself charting God's ocean. I wonder if you will think in the terms of men and go out and be your own builders and architects. The race waits on you. It will never be greater than you make it and think of it. You haven't laid the foundation of your commercial system, your political system, yet you mimic the white man and say you are unemployed. There is nothing scarcely for him to do. He has already built his banks, railways, ships. He has already defined the boundaries of his political systems. He has no more cities to expand and you just follow him saying you are tired and you haven't laid a brick. You haven't sent one ship a thousand times across the ocean. When we tried, the Negro himself destroyed the project. When I came in a while ago, a lady told me her husband invested $25. I do not believe he did. We have a lot of mouth, but when it comes for us to do constructive work, we're absent. Yet we envy the other man for his progress. Booker Washington described us as crabs in a basket, pulling each other down all the time. That is our peculiar psychology. If I were a white man who had honored the Reverend Stewart as another white man with my presence to lecture, these same Negroes who could not find 35 cents to pay me would find $2 to pay the white man, but because I'm a black man, they think I'm not worth 35 cents. Any businessman would decide that a people who wouldn't pay 35 cents to be enlightened have no attraction for him to waste his time upon. We must start thinking and think seriously. 
I cannot do anything for you in Halifax until you have made up your minds to do something for yourself. No man is completely helped from without. He is helped from within. The thing must be from within. What I want to do today is to pull you out of yourself. Every man is a living entity. Every man is a living fact. Every man is a living force. And every man should do for himself because God made him with a single mind and intelligence. Now understand that it wasn't Rockefeller who produced electricity. It wasn't Edison who produced oil. It wasn't Marconi who produced steam. It wasn't George Stevenson who produced the effect of the circulation of the blood. It wasn't Watt who laid the system of the railroad track. Each of these contributions to civilization was done by an independent mind. Therefore, every man has within him a thought that can be of use in nature. Marconi gave us the wireless telegraph. What are you going to give? Go home today. Pray to your Lord to reveal what you are best fitted for, so that you may give to the world something new so that you may rise next morning and be a new genius that may baffle a startled and wandering world. Do not live in the world and pass out of it like chickens and sheep. When you die, leave behind you the memories of men, the memories of Shakespeare, Mrs. Hermans, Victoria, Florence Nightingale, Bismarck, Caesar, Mussolini, Hitler, Mackenzie King. Have you ever thought of the fact that as old as the world is, and according to the religionist, it is 6,000 years old? That billions and trillions of people have passed out of the world, and since Adam came here, you will find about 36 names written in history as having done something. From Moses to Mussolini, the men who have stood out, the wolves at Quebec, the Washingtons, the Bismarcks, the Sir Christopher Wrens, names of men who have passed away like Moses, like Abraham, like Solomon and David are as fresh in the minds of people as if they died yesterday. What are you going to do? Are you going to achieve that greatness to live behind you in marble and steel because you made a contribution? Again, I ask what contribution are you going to make to your race, to your world? The Universal Negro Improvement Association is asking you to think it over so that a thousand years from now it will be written in the records that a great Negro man or woman came from Halifax who started great continental systems and built the loftiest monuments in commerce and industry. If you read, you will hear about the Universal Negro Improvement Association because it is broadcast all over the world. We publish a monthly magazine, The Black Man. In it, we send the message around the world to those who will not eat up everything but save a cent to know what is going on. You will read from my pen in the black man if you do not see me again. My writings are based on the idea to inspire you to the greatest achievement and that is the highest service a man can render his race. Who is to tell that some of you sitting here today may not be immortalized? I do hope that what I've said will bear some fruit for your own good. The future world is going to eliminate all the dead things, whether they be dead branches of a tree or dead living men. The people who rule the world are as practical as the world is. And when it comes to the point of getting rid of useless matter, whether it be killing 10 million men in war or killing millions of Abyssinians or killing a hundred million Chinese, it doesn't matter to the minds that rule the world. You must realize that all dead matter will be destroyed. Do not let us constitute ourselves dead matter. The Australian Bushmen, the North American Indian have been buried. Do you think the people in Halifax are going to continue carrying dead matter? I trust you will analyze and understand what I am saying. I do hope that in the words of the chairman, what I have said will bear fruit. May God bless you and may he keep you and give you the thought to realize that you sit and rise and wake on your own mental responsibility.
You are listening to an On A Level production featuring the resurrection of Marcus Messiah Garvey series. We can grow. We can develop. As we know that heaven is not a place and happiness lives in the heart. Long as the world keep turning, I do years to keep on learning. You heard? Keep on learning. It's soaking up the game. We gon' make mistakes. We gon' go through some pain. Keep on growing. Keep on soaking up the game. If something ain't working, don't be afraid to change. You've just been listening to The Making of South, originally delivered October 1937. This concludes day 25, and we want to thank Tawanda Mohammed for today's narration. Tawanda Mohammed has been a motivational speaker and Dianetics counselor since 2011. Tawanda says he was over the moon when he was asked to participate in the Marcus Garvey project because Garvey is one of his heroes who helped him towards self-knowledge. Each one, teach one, we got to pass it on. Keep doing the knowledge, building and adding on. With faith in the assumption that nobody knows everything, but everybody knows Keep something. So we welcome your comments, opinions and feedback on the resurrection of Marcus Garvey series so far. Should you wish to share with us, you can by email on on a level at hotmail.co.uk that's o-n hyphen a hyphen level at hotmail.co.uk the more you know the more you know you don't know and if you don't know there's more you can know then you won't grow what you don't know can hurt you discipline is a virtue gotta ask the right questions or else you go in the cycles and cycles and spirals information is viral this infects you it's contagious and how you go into stages like the night as you know in this series we are paying homage to marcus messiah garvey as Black History Month is all about celebration. So join me to give a few shout outs, starting with Garvey's parents, Mama Sarah Jane Richards and Pops Marcus Garvey Sr. As a people out of the drum, we come. We also want to pay homage to those esteemed ancestors who paved the way for Marcus to appear on the world stage. As a people, out of the drum we come. We also pay homage to the graduates of the School of African Philosophy. Out of the drum. And all of the founding members and supporters of the UNIA. The dance of the elder. Everybody, everybody. Dance. Last but not least, we pay special homage and tribute to his esteemed wife, Amy Jakes Garvey, who was a formidable leader in her own right. Everybody, everybody dance. Respect yourself. Mrs. Garvey kept her husband's legacy alive, and it is partly because of her loving efforts that we can share this groundbreaking series with you today. Tune in tomorrow at the same time for the resurrection of Marcus Messiah Garvey with me, Jermaine Brown. I'm going to leave you with the famous anthem that Marcus Garvey and the UNIA members had wanted to be adopted as the universal anthem for black people across the globe. The dance of the elder. Everybody, everybody dance. Let's take a moment to listen and feel free to wave your red, black and green flag should you have one. Up your library. You can accomplish what you will. Fight be victorious when swords are thrust outward to gleam. For us will the victory be glorious when led by the red, black, and green. Advance, 
Oh, dear motherland, advance, advance. 